turn with me in the Word of God this morning, the very familiar portion of God's Word for this season of the year, the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. Luke's Gospel chapter 2, and then we're just going to read a little also from chapter 4. Luke's Gospel chapter 2. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And just keep your finger there and turn across to chapter 4. We've come now a full 30 years from the event that we have read of in chapter 2. The Lord Jesus has been baptized. He has gone out into the wilderness and has been tempted of the devil. In chapter 4 and verse 14 says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he was brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found a place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He, handed, or he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him, and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. Amen. The Lord will bless to us the reading of his precious word. You bow with prayer, in prayer with me, please, as we seek the Lord for his help and grace. Father, our prayer today again is that we would see Jesus and to see him only. And this, Lord, we know is a prayer that is in accordance with your will because it is the will of, of God, the Father, that all men should honor the Son. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit to take of the things of Christ and to show them to us. Lord, we know that our hearts will remain darkened and distant and cold if your Holy Spirit does not come and reveal to us the Christ of God that we might see him with the eyes of our faith and with our hearts. O oh Lord, today by your Spirit come. Anoint us, anoint our lips, anoint our hearts. O oh God, today give glory to the man of your right hand by revealing him in all the fullness of his beauty and glory and sufficiency to the souls of all, that we might, Lord, be drawn to him with joy and faith and gladness. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Advent season, as we call it, is one which is and which certainly ought to be marked by celebration and by jubilation. I think all of us and all people who are acquainted with Christmas at all will recognize this. But for many, the celebration and the jubilation is one which is but of a superficial and transient kind. It is, mere, it is mere sentimentalism, a passing feeling provoked by music and gifts and revelry. But for the Christian, this time has a deeper and more significant nature than the world can see. And the joy that it produces in the hearts of believers is one which is of a deeper and more enduring nature. Because it is the child of God whose eyes have been enlightened by the Holy Spirit who can see and believe the real truth concerning Christmas. The word itself, as we have seen in previous messages, literally means Christ is sent. And this is truly why we gather together to worship on this season of the year. Because as the Apostle John reminds us, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Dr. J.I. Packer said that there is nothing in fiction so fantastic as this truth of the Incarnation. There is nothing that boggles the mind, to use a common expression, Nothing that amazes our understanding and our reason more than the truth that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This truth concerning the person whose advent, whose coming, is at the heart of this season is revealed in the names that he was given. His name as we saw at the Lord's table last Sunday morning, is like ointment poured forth. His name stands for and signifies all that he is. And all that he is, is all that we need. His name is Jesus, which literally, as we saw, means the Lord saves or the Lord is salvation. And surely that in itself ought to be to us good tidings of great joy. For unto us has been born a Savior, and that is above everything else what we as sinners need. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. This baby born of the Virgin and cradled in an animal feeding trough, in a, sta in a stable or in a cave in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, born of a virgin, therefore truly man, but also truly God, is because he is of these two natures perfectly qualified to do the work of saving sinners. We come this morning to deal with another name, very familiar to us, often used by us, often upon our lips, but yet I feel not truly, truly realized as far as the depth of its significance is concerned. And it is the name again proclaimed by the angel to the shepherds, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Very literally in Scripture it is the Christ, Christ the Lord. How often have we referred to our Savior by this name as Christ? And we have wondered perhaps at times what exactly is signified by that particular name. Some people think it is like a surname, Jesus being his first name and Christ being his surname, but that is not the case. He would have been known in the days of his flesh as Jesus of Nazareth. He would have been known as Jesus, the son of Joseph, because it was presumed that Joseph was his father. But this word Christ is not so much 
A name, a personal name, as a title. It is, as I've said, used in Scripture with a definite article. It is the Christ. And the word Christ comes from a verb, creo, which literally means to anoint. It is the equivalent of the word Messiah, which comes from the word Mashach, which means to anoint. It is Messiah in the Hebrew. It is Christos, or Christ in the Greek. And the very literal translation of this word, this title, means the anointed one. This, of course, was the confession of his own people. That Jesus of Nazareth was indeed God's anointed one. You remember when Andrew had come to the Lord Jesus Christ at his call, we are told that he first found his own brother, Peter. And here was Andrew's testimony to Peter. We have found Christ. Again, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, you remember that the Savior said to his disciples, Whom do men say that I am? And they said, Some say you're John the Baptist, or some Elias, or Jeremiah, or some of the prophets. But he said to them, Whom do you say that I am? And Peter's affirmation was clear and bold. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But this was not only the confession of his people, this was the claim that he made for himself. You remember in John's Gospel, chapter 4, how that at Sychar's well, at Jacob's well, and Sychar and Samaria, the Lord Jesus Christ met up with a sinful woman and began to search her heart and to save her soul. And in the conversation that took place between them on that occasion, this woman said, we know that when the Messiah comes, when the Anointed One comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said, I that speak unto you am He. I am the Messiah. I am the Anointed One. And this is not only the confession of God's people and the claim that Jesus made for Himself, but this is the challenge, I believe, of the whole of the Scripture. As John, the writer of the Gospel, in chapter 20 of that Gospel, came to the end of his writing in chapter 20 and verses 30 and verse 31, he said, Many other things Jesus did, which are not written in these, this book, but these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that you believing you might have life through his name. According to John, the very reason for his gospel was that people might believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the anointed one, that he was the Son of God, and in believing that, we might have life through his name. This title, Christ, Messiah, anointed one, like all the other names by which he is known is full of meaning. You'll remember that we have taken as the question that will summarize the four messages of Advent, the question, what's in a name, taken it, stolen it from Shakespeare, and used in that context to convey the idea that names don't matter, that the name is insignificant. But we have seen that when it comes to this one whom we worship today, that his name is far from insignificant. That his name is everything. That is what has led us to look at his name. It's Jesus, Emmanuel, and this morning again, Christ, the Anointed One. What does it signify? What does this title signify about his person? Well, to answer that question, I think we need to go back into the Old Testament Scriptures. You will find that there were three groups of people who by the command of God were to be anointed and to be anointed with oil. Kings were anointed. You want an example of that? You remember how Samuel the prophet was told to go to Bethlehem and to go to the household of Jesse and to anoint one of his sons to be king over Israel. And this became the practice in the Old Covenant 
that when kings came to the throne, they were anointed. This was common practice. And not only were kings or princes anointed, but the priests in the Old Covenant were anointed. And you can read of this in the book of Exodus and in the book of Leviticus when the Aaronic priesthood, the priesthood of Aaron, it was in existence and set apart by God to fulfill the role of priests in the, to the nation of Israel. When they were coming to that point where they were ordained to their office, one of the practices was that they were to be anointed. And that, as I say, by God's command. Not only were princes anointed and priests anointed, but prophets were anointed. In 1 Kings we read that Elijah at Horeb was given the command of God to, to go and anoint Elisha to succeed him as a prophet to Israel. So these three groups of people, prophets, priests and kings, were, and I emphasize, by divine command to be anointed with oil. And what was the significance in this? Well, it was threefold. First of all, this was to signify that this individual who was anointed at the command of God had been chosen by God to that particular office and to fulfill that particular ministry. And not only did it signify that they were chosen by God, but they were thereby consecrated by God. That is to say that they were set apart to the fulfillment of of a particular task. And thirdly, the significance of the anointing was also that God was thereby conferring upon them all the needed gifts and all the needed grace, all the qualifications, if you like, that they would require in order that they might fulfill the task to which God had chosen them. Now all of this, of course, we know was typical. It belongs to the types and to the shadows of the Old Testament covenant. Prophets and priests and kings being anointed had a significance that was not only seen in relation to them, but had a future prophetical significance as well. Because you see, all of the people of Israel realized the while these kings, these priests, and these prophets were anointed ones, that they, as it were, prefigured a greater one who was to be the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, who was yet to come. And of course, they had many prophecies concerning that. And this was understood even in the days of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember how Matthew tells us of the visit of the Magi, the wise men, to seek the newborn king of the Jews. They had come to Jerusalem, they had inquired of Herod the Great and of his court. And you remember how that Herod, when he heard the message that a king of the Jews had been born, called for the religious leaders of the people of Israel at that time and we are told that he inquired of them, listen, where the Christ would be born. They knew that there was an anointed one who was yet to come, who was to be born. And you'll know the story of how that they were able to refer him to the prophecy of Micah. And where Micah talked about that out of Bethlehem Ephratah, who was not the least among the clans of Judah, that out of Bethlehem would come a governor who would shepherd his people Israel. And according to these religious leaders of Israel, that was a prophecy concerning the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One. And so there was this expectation that there would be one would come who would be anointed, who would be in a very unique sense the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ. All that we have talked about this morning from the Old Covenant with reference to the practice of anointing prophets, priests, and kings has therefore been fulfilled in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. In the, Gospel, or the book of Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the Apostle Peter is preaching 
and he is preaching to the household of Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion. And as he ministers and preaches on that occasion, there is a significant statement that he made in Acts chapter 10 and in verse 38. He said this to them, Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable unto him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. Here it is. How that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. It was abundantly clear, therefore, to the Apostle Peter that the Anointed One, the Messiah of whom the prophets had spoke and who, had predict who they predicted would come, that this one, this one was anointed by God. This was the Anointed One. Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. And if you need further reference, references to establish that, think of the prayers of the Apostles in Acts chapter 4. You remember how that they had been threatened by the Jewish Sanhedrin and they had been told never again to preach or teach in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they left the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, they gathered together with their own company and they prayed and they sought the face of God. And this was their prayer in Acts chapter 4 and verse 26. The kings of the earth, this is in the middle of their prayer, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Where were they quoting from? They were quoting from the second psalm. Very literally against the Lord. If you're using the King James Bible, I think it says against the Lord and against his Christ, which is actually right, against his anointed one. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. Both Herod, Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatsoever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. You can see exactly what the apostles were saying in their prayers. That that prophecy made concerning the anointed one away back in the book of Psalms, centuries before, had now been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ who was anointed by God. God himself anointed Jesus. God himself anointed him. And God anointed him with his Holy Spirit. That's what it says in Acts 10 and 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. When did that take place? That took place at his baptism. You remember that coming up out of the water after having been baptized by John, the Spirit of God descended upon him in the form of a dove, and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And subsequent to that event, you find this ongoing reference to the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Lord, that he was driven out, by the Holy Spirit to be tempted of the devil in the wilderness. That he was full of the Holy Spirit. And then he comes into the synagogue at Nazareth when he returns from his temptation in the wilderness and he unrolls the scroll of the prophecy of Isaiah. And what does he read? Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he had done what? He has anointed me. And he reads through this passage from Isaiah 61 and then he turns to the congregation who are gathered and he says, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. What's he saying? God anointed me. I am the one of whom Isaiah spoke 800 years ago. I am the suffering servant of Jehovah. I am the one upon whom the Holy Spirit has come to rest by the appointment and by the action of God himself. I am God's anointed. 
And every time we use the word Christ, that's what we're saying. That's what we're declaring. He is the one whom God has anointed. And just as in the old covenant, the significance was set forth in type and shadow, now it has come to its full fulfillment and realization. What was God saying when he anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit? He was saying, I have chosen him. I have consecrated him. And I have conferred upon him all needed grace and power for the work to which I have appointed him. I have given him my Holy Spirit. And God so anointed him that he would fulfill these three great offices that we talked about earlier. The office of a prophet, the office of a priest, and the office of a king. Chosen, consecrated and the power and the grace and the gifts thus conferred upon him by his anointing. He therefore, my friends, is the king, God's king, God's anointed king. He is the high priest of his people who sacrifices not the blood of bulls and goats but his own blood as a sacrifice and substitute on their behalf and who intercedes for them and he is the great prophet of our God who in himself is the revelation of God's character of God's heart and of God's mind and of God's desire for sinful men he's the anointed one his very name Christ tells us all of this about his person. But it is something also to tell us about his purpose. We're looking again at Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, and verses 18 and 19. Luke 4, 18 and 19, again reading, In the synagogue he reads these words, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do what? And he goes over the things for which he had been anointed. He was anointed to proclaim good news to the poor. If you're using the King James Version, it's more accurate and it includes something which has been left out in the newer versions. Immediately after this, he says, to heal the brokenhearted. Don't know why it was left out, because it's right there in Isaiah chapter 61. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. He has sent me to recover the sight of the blind. He has sent me to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is saying, listen, this prophecy given by Isaiah that God would anoint one with the power of the Holy Spirit, this prophecy was given in order that I might do certain things. His purpose, the purpose for which he was anointed, is one of grace. Because if you look down through the list of people that are mentioned here, who does he mention? He mentions the poor. Literally, back in Isaiah chapter 61, the word that is translated poor is actually the word afflicted. So he has come to minister to the afflicted. He has come to minister to the brokenhearted. He has come to minister to the captives, to the blind, to the oppressed. This is why God anointed him. This is why God chose him. He called him my chosen. This is why God consecrated him and set him apart. This is why God conferred upon him the power of the Holy Spirit that he might minister in grace to these groups of people, to you and I. Because I think you can summarize these, these people that are mentioned here under three headings. The poor. Who are they? They are the broken, the afflicted. What are we by nature and because of sin we are broken? Not only minister to the broken, but he has come to minister to those who are in bondage. Look at the reference to the captives and to the oppressed. What are we by nature but slaves of sin? And what is more, he has come to minister not only to the broken and to those who are in bondage, but he has come to minister to those who are blind. Notice the reference to the recovering of sight to the blind. 
What are we by nature? We're blinded by the God of this world. We cannot see the truths concerning ourselves, concerning spiritual realities, concerning the truth as it is in Jesus left to ourselves. We need our eyes opened and the Messiah has come, the anointed one has been anointed for this very purpose. That he might heal our brokenness, that he might release us from our bondage, and that he might give us spiritual sight. Dr. Lloyd-Jones, in preaching on this section of God's Word, points out something that I think should be clearly understood, and yet is not. That the Lord Jesus Christ, in order that he might do these very things for us in his grace, had to be more than simply a teacher. He had to be more than simply an example. Imagine, for example, a person who is totally blind and a person goes to them merely as a teacher and tells them, I've got a lot of instruction for you. How is that going to help them? The man's blind. He needs to see. He doesn't need an example. He can't see the example. His greatest need is sight. Our Lord Jesus, yes, he was the great teacher. He was the teacher of all teachers. He was the perfect, perfect example. But listen, he came into this world to do what? Not merely to be the example, not merely to be the teacher, but to be the savior of sinners. To meet them in their brokenness, in their bondage, in their blindness, and actually to deliver them from their sin and from all of the effects of their sin. To heal their broken hearts. To break the chains that bind them. And to open those eyes that were blinded so that they might see. That's, that's the reason for which he was the Christ, the anointed one. He must not merely be the teacher and the example. He must be the physician. He must be the liberator. And he must be the comforter. He was anointed to that end. Remember what Peter said in Acts 10, 38 again, a key text. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. Doesn't end it there. And he went about doing good. And healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Listen, my friends, this morning we need the Christ. We need the one who was anointed for this very purpose and to this end that our slavery might be broken, that our blindness might be healed, and that our brokenness, our brokenness might be dealt with. Finally, what does this produce in us? I said in the introduction to this message that this is the season of celebration and this is the season of jubilation. And it is so not because of presents and parties, but it is so because of the person whom we worship at this time of the year. And it is so because this person of whom we have been speaking is not only the Savior, God's Savior. He is not only God manifested in the flesh, verily God, yet become truly human, but he is also God's anointed one. Anointed to do all of this for us. And if you're saved this morning, you have experienced the effects of his anointing. He has come to you in your brokenness. He has come to you in your spiritual bondage. He has come to you in your spiritual blindness. And by the power of the spirit with which he was anointed, he has healed and delivered and comforted. You understanding now why this is a season of great joy? If you go through, go back again to chapter 61 of Isaiah. And in that chapter, it goes on to explain some of the effects that the work of the Messiah, the Anointed One, would have upon those who he ministered to in grace. And you'll find words like this, for example, in chapter 61 and verse 3 of Isaiah, that he will give beauty for ashes. He will give the oil of joy for mourning. And he will give the garment of praise 
for the spirit of heaviness. Who are those who thus know this beauty, this oil of joy, this garment of praise, those who have known the effect of him being anointed to heal, to liberate, and to comfort. <clears throat> Tidings of comfort and joy. That's why John Wesley wrote these words in the great hymn, Jesus, lover of my soul. He says, Thou, O Christ, there's the term again. Thou, Christ, art all I want. More than all in thee I find. Cheer the fallen, raise the faint, heal the sick and lead the blind. Just and holy is thy name. I am all unrighteousness, vile and full of sin I am. But thou art full of truth and grace. And that's why we sing with gladness at this time of the year. O oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord.